Please sign in if you haven't already. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, good morning. Nico, how are you? Doing good? Good morning, Terry. Tell me that you can hear me okay. Good morning, ladies. Yes, thank you. Good. Try something a little different today. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're starting to get in on time. That's great. Everybody see the sign-up sheets in the back? Yes. 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 I want to. I want to start a little different this morning, and uh, let's see if uh, let's see if we can uh, do something different. I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask you to uh, stand up. We're going to lift up our hands and we're going to bless the Lord this morning. If you want to keep your mask on, feel free to do that. If you don't, uh, feel free to do that. But there, there are several significant things about our hands. This will be very quick. Hands are very significant in the scriptures. Hands represent work. So if you read Mark's gospel, by the way, sidebar. His whole view of Jesus is servant. Jesus is the suffering servant. So he shows Jesus laying hands on the leper, laying hands on this one, that one, in ways that the other gospels don't. Hands are significant. David prayed this way. He said, Lord, may the lifting of my hands be as the, the evening sacrifice. Well, usually uh, it's in the morning for me, so I just change it. May the lifting of my hands be as a, a morning sacrifice. What does that mean? It means that David actually... Uh, had this sense. He had insight into the into the throne room that was way before his time. But he had the sense that some physical action that we could take in in a sense of worship would be received just the same way as the the shedding of blood, the bulls, the goats, all those things that would be sacrificed. May the lifting of my hands be as. I, I'm in a cave right now. I can't get to a sacrifice, but this is what I can do. How I many of you know you can sacrifice everywhere all the time, all the time? Uh, the, so the lifting of hands is a weapon of war. Romans chapter 6 says, says, don't let your bodies be instruments of sin. The word is hoplon, literally means weapon. Don't let your body, body be a weapon for sin, but let it be a weapon for righteousness. And then Paul gives this, it's in the imperative in the original language, and he's talking to men specifically. It's not just mankind, men and women, but he says, I would that men in every place lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Why would it be important for men to lift up their hands? It'd be great if some ladies would answer that. 
Why should men lift up their hands in praise and worship? Men are designed to be the initiator. They can't carry it all, but they initiate things. And so when men lift up their hands, it frees the atmosphere and it frees the mindset of everyone else. How many of you know children are watching what their daddies are doing when men lift up hands? So hands is a, is a powerful weapon. Hands is a sacrifice unto the Lord. I mean, you know, hands can also say, stop. This is as far as you go and no further. And this is a part of our warfare. This is as far as you go. Okay. This can also be just total surrender. A little child saying, Daddy, take me up higher. Put me on your shoulders. I want to see from your perspective. How many of you like to see from the Father's perspective this morning? So let's lift up our hands. Any, any one of those you want to use. And I want you just to ask the Father to, to work in your life. Today we offer our lives as a sacrifice to you. Come on, lift up your voice. We offer our lives as a sacrifice to you. We lift up holy hands without wrath, without doubt. We, we declare, Lord, we can't do it today. We want to live beyond ourselves today. We want to see from your perspective today. Lift us up. Lord, put us on your shoulders today. Let us see from your perspective. Let us see people the way you see them. Let us see the situations the way you see it. Let us see our own life the way you see it. In Jesus' name. May the lifting of our hands be as the morning sacrifice, O oh God. May it please your heart that our bodies are weapons of righteousness today. Our mouths will do its service today. We bless you. We praise you. We give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's say it with our hands. Come on. Say it with us. Amen. 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 Now, fist pump or high five or do the virtual something or other with somebody next to you, okay? It's important that we connect with each other when we come. You can be you can be reseated. I'll just give you one more story that goes with that. As we're admitting some folks, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Everybody's surprised they're actually getting admitted into class today. You can't imagine how many of our... Uh, of our virtual students have been left out, and I'm so sorry, glad to have you today. We are getting figured out. Um, everybody know the name Catherine Kuhlman? Yes. Catherine Kuhlman, okay. Uh, everybody know the name Amy Simple McPherson? Yes. Okay, Amy Simple McPherson was in a large tent meeting. I started telling another story about Catherine Kuhlman, but this is, this is the one I want. Amy Simple McPherson was in a large tent meeting, kind of the same era of Gordon Lindsay, in the healing, voice of healing movement. And uh, thousands of people are under this tent, and she's on the platform, and she sees over to her left, outside the tent, in the darkness, some men with some guns coming toward the tent. Back in those days, they, they probably weren't going to shoot anybody. They just wanted to disrupt. They wanted to disrupt whatever the the holy rollers were doing. And and she saw it, and the Lord just said to her, clap as if you're driving them back. And so she just told everybody, I want you to lift up your hands and begin to clap. And they began to clap. And she said, literally, as she would clap, it was like they were getting hit uh, by an angelic being. And she watched them fall back and fall back and fall back until they turned around and ran. Your body can be a spiritual weapon. Maybe not always just like that. I can't clap and declare what my hands are going to do, but I can declare that my body will be a weapon of righteousness, not a weapon of evil. I mean, even though you you make a covenant with your eyes, that they be a, a, a weapon of righteousness. Amen. All right. I want you to engage with me today. I'm going to take you somewhere that uh, is probably going to challenge all of us. And I'm going to start with a couple of readings, which is a real, uh, uh, not just a little bit, but really unusual for me. Um, I need to, to hit present here. And we'll get you there. Okay. Now I need to, pres now I need to do what? Uh, share my screen and get my, yoo the guy you were listening to on the uh, speakers as you came in, his name is John Mark Pantana. 
and uh, grew up in church, became really angry at God, and uh, ran as hard as he could the other way, two different times. And uh, he's a he's got an incredible revelation now of the Father heart uh, of God, the love of the Father. But it didn't come easy. And uh, he's got an album. Uh, I'm not getting paid to pimp his stuff, but it, he his music is like the soundtrack of my soul. I mean, the revelation he has of the Father's love is just incredible. Uh, he's got an album called Love Secrets. He's kind of a farm boy from Arkansas. Um, but each song on the album, he's written a chapter to, so that you can get the book with the album, and it's, it's pretty powerful. I wanted to read just the first uh, couple of pages to you, give you an insight of why we have to reevaluate our views of God. I don't know how many of you have grown up in church, how many of you have just been saved recently. Don't know. It doesn't matter. All of us have uh, projections. We project uh, from our authorities, especially from our fathers and our mothers, we project those ideas, whether consciously or subconsciously, we pre project those onto God. And we think we have a right view. All of us think we have a right view. I have to take you to this. You know, we've got uh, midterms coming up next, uh, next week. Just to put you at ease, Tuesday, we're going to prep you for the midterm. That's all we're going to do is get ready for it. It's going to be easy. Everybody say easy. It's going to be really easy, but it's going to be focused on this. The things that we've talked about the last three, three and a half weeks about our perspective, where we get our view of God. So this is a real important piece of that. And uh, Thursday, if we can get through this, we're going to look at those 10 unchangeables that also impact our view of God. If we're angry with God because of the way he's wired us and framed us, or uh, if we're receiving what he's done as a love gift. I'm going to start with this, and then we're going to look at four ways that we tend to view God. Uh, this is uh, from his song, On Your Mind. The night was Halloween, and I was trying to impress the cool kids at the local rock, rock concert. Fresh off some heavy World, uh, world of Warcraft withdrawals, I was, offered, I was offered my first cigarette uh, at 19 years old. Three years later, and I was smoking two packs of Cowboy Killers per day. When I left the faith for the second time at the age of 22, I wanted to intentionally middle finger God. I thought, might as well go for the gold. He, he talks kind of frank. If you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and read it understand where he's coming from. After a few violent upchucks, I was pretty much done with alcohol. Pop, on the other hand, yeah, I kind of became a poster child. I loved it. I rocked a hand-woven Rasta beanie and my gnarly bare feet 24-7. I laughed in disbelief for 10 minutes the first time. My THC brain flavor-enhanced an entire bag of Krispy Kreme donuts. Add in neutral pathway, movie marathons to accompany a good music in this addict-prone, God-hating white boy was so, for a solid two years, I was high as a guy. This is a guy that grew up in church. I would highly recommend not smoking cigarettes or otherwise. The pothead John Mark would read the recommendation, rose glassy eyes and blankety blank you. I'd recommend you shove that unsolicited advice up your you know what, Captain. That was his phrase. Zoom in on my stone squinty eyes and behind them was literally tens of thousands of Christian sermons on behavior and surrender. The two pillars of being a good Christian. Name any famous prominent voice for Christianity in America. And I had devoured their content with no lasting change. The only fruit at birth in my heart was shame. I tried to behave and couldn't. I could not with good conscience surrender to an untrustworthy God. Every well intentioned. And so my actions followed. 
In the middle of my open rebellion, while I thought God a rude old man with a hard nature, his thoughts toward me were good. He had not distanced himself, not one inch from my hot mess. I was on his mind even. On my darkest day, this becomes one of the theme phrases of his lyric. I was on your mind even on my darkest day. Have any of you had a darkest day yet? Then he quotes Ephesians 1.4. Before he made the God, along at all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, have been taking Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 for about a week solid, just a week solid, just that. Before he formed anything, he chose us as his sons. And without fault in his eyes, I believe his fathering heart is provoked by our rebellion, but only the compassion. His affections are set on us. He intercedes for our awakening to his very nearness. It wasn't until the root of my beliefs changed that I began to change. Listen to that. It wasn't until the root of my beliefs changed that I began to change. The foundation of my wrong believing was that righteousness ebbed and flowed with my behavior. I had to behave into goodness. This foundation is sinking sand, constantly shifting providing no solid ground to build our Christian life on. I continually beheld myself in the mirror of the law. Can I do it? Yeah, I can. I, I grasp, I embrace the code. I try to, uh, try to defend the code, which by its unbending nature only revealed my inadequacy. This mirror communicates you are what you do. I then began beholding myself in the mirror of Christ, who by his nature revealed my perfect righteousness in him. Where the law had demanded righteousness in my behavior, Christ liberally and lovingly provided himself as my righteousness. This mirror communicates as Christ is, so are you. You got two big voices. One is the, the, what the law says. You are what you do. Now, that was the rabbinical code of the Old Testament. Do, do, do. And if you do it all right, you might be declared righteous. But when Paul got through receiving his revelation from Jesus Christ, what was it? Flip that. You're declared righteous by being in Christ so that you do out of that righteousness. to worship in Christ Jesus, the judge, first and foremost, and he's measuring our behavior, then guess what? We're going to do everything we can to be good in our behavior. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Aren't you glad he nailed that list to the cross of Jesus Christ? This is what Paul says to the Colossians. He nailed every ordinance that was against us, nailed it to his cross. It was taken care of. So here's the way we're going to look at God, and here's some tendencies. And I realized about 5 o'clock this morning that you've not been reading the books because they weren't assigned to you. And normally in the classes where I get to this point in my teaching, you've already read the book, and so you're, you're wanting some discussion about it. 
And I've kind of set you up. I'm throwing you into the deep end pretty quick here. But I'm treating you like spiritually hungry sons and daughters that want to know their Abba. So let me give you four. We're going to look at four ways that we tend to relate to God. And every one of them have some right to them. Please hear me because I'm going to say this several times. But when I put them on the screen, you're going to think I'm saying this is all wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. These four ways all have some good things about them. But it's a 350 mile gas tank on a 400 mile drive. They won't quite get you there. So we'll talk about the fifth one, which is the key, which is what John Mark Fantana discovered was not about behavior, was not about somehow keeping the code, being a good Christian, behaving my way in, even if it's attendance of church and tithe and all those kinds of things. Okay? I know in your mind you said, I already got this. All right, stick with me, but don't get mad at me. My name is Carrie, and I'm your friend. This is Sky Jathani's book called With. That's kind of the uh, spoiler right there. Unfortunately, a great many people have settled for a darker existence, one under a shadow in which they relate to God. Way that to get I just, I get just that could be important for you to kind of get these four stories as examples of what we're talking about. I've not met Joel before he came to my office for what he called spiritual advice. A middle aged man with some success at business, Joel described himself as a Christian with a weakness for alcohol, women, and gambling. The latter being the reason for his visit, he had run in some bad debts and it was now jeopardizing his business. I'm sorry for your troubles, Joel, I said, but I'm not sure why you've come to see me. He says, well, I don't go to church much, but I know that's uh, I know what's right and wrong. I'm concerned that God isn't going to bless my business because of what I've done. I want to make things right with him. I can't afford to have my partners and God against me. I had a man in my church a few years ago down in Houston. He came up to me. Uh, one Sunday morning after church, he says, Pastor, he's a he's one of these uh, nine to nine uh, businessmen driven, uh, building it big. And he said, Pastor, I come for just one good nugget. If I can get one good nugget out of your sermon that will help me build and grow my business, it's a great day. And I told him, I said, Steve, you will never be happy here. And he was there before I got there, but I was young and brash enough to say it. You'll never be happy here because that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to help you grow your business. I'm here to grow you in a relationship with the Father. And what he does with your business is going to be up to him. Okay, so here's number one. Here's a guy that sees God as one that needs to be pleased and appeased so we can stay on the right side of God and get the goodies. Here's Mark. Mark was a well-read man. He devoured every business leadership book he could find, but he wasn't a business leader. Mark was a pastor. We met at ministry conference and shared lunch together. Mark begins this way. The problem with most pastors is that they think they're immune to market forces. They don't understand the basic principles on which every organization rises or falls. They just don't teach that stuff in seminary. In other words, they don't teach business principles in seminary. He says, I can't stand all that spiritualizing that goes on at these ministry conferences. We just coming up with excuses for being bad leaders, for not doing more. And underscore that for you. 
not doing more. Have you ever heard any sermons that said try harder, do more, work harder, pray more, fast more, more? Pray more so you can get more. Do you think that managers of Walmart sit around and contemplate? Why do people expect us to sit around and pray all the time? I'm not going to let my church atrophy like so many others. I'm going to build it. This is Mark, the pastor, entrepreneur. Rebecca was a senior at a respected Christian college with graduation just months away. Talking to the right group here, right? With graduation just months away, she was wrestling with what she would do next. She said, I've always dreamed of going on medical school, uh, going on to medical school. She said, I, I've got the grades to probably get in, but I'm just not sure I should do it. Well, why not? I asked. What's holding you back? I'm not sure that that's what God wants me to do. I mean, does the world really need another cardiologist? I want my life to matter more than that. I want to do something really significant. Like what? Like be a missionary, she said. Maybe in order to serve him, God wants me to sacrifice my dream of becoming a doctor. I just don't want to reach the end and feel like I missed out on a more significant life. <clears throat> so it's quiet here. Karen said, I don't understand what I did wrong. Through tears. So we have these four. These four examples, Joel, Mark, Rebecca, Karen. Here's life from God. Joel, the fast living businessman, sought to use God to bless his business. He embodies the posture of life from God. Everybody say it with me. Life from God. I'm going to get from God what I need to have a successful life. People in this category want God's blessings and gifts, but they're not particularly interested in God himself. Now, this is the story of the prodigal son and his older brother. I mean, you know, both the prodigal son and the older brother wanted dad stuff, but neither one of them were particularly interested in being with dad. One took his inheritance early and went to have his own party. The other one is dutifully working out in the field. Is the picture of most church folks. I guess we found a better way to do it. Didn't have much space in his life or ministry of God. This is the life over God posture. What could life over God be? The mystery and wonder of the world is lost as God is abandoned in favor of proven formulas and controllable outcomes. In other words, God has made the world set certain laws and principles in motion. And if you can discover those laws and principles and turn that crank, turn that handle and push that button, then you don't need God. All you need is the principles and the precepts to do it the way he designed it. Anybody feeling uncomfortable yet? <laughs> it's fun to watch, watch at least the eyes of the faces. Here's life for God. Here we're talking about over God, under God, for God, and from God. Rebecca, the graduating senior dreaming of medical school, was primarily concerned with how to best serve God. The most celebrated of religious postures is life for God. The most significant life, it believes, 
is the one expended accomplishing great things in God's service. Every mission school tends this way. Another one, and that's the one we want to. Okay, would you like to see how this looks as we map it out? We finished the other day, and I, I hadn't got this right. It's going to cut off a little bit of the bottom uh, of our picture, but we'll have to do with it. The very essence of being human is social interaction, which creates empathy and builds trusting relationships. The very essence of being human is social interaction, which creates empathy and builds trusting relationships. James Comer, a sociologist, not a believer, in his studies has said this, there is no significant learning which occurs without relationships. We are made in the image of God as relational beings. We thr thrive, we grow, we learn best through relationships. Okay? So we have to ask these questions. What might this tell us about spending time with God? Why would we need time with him? Why was God all about walking with Adam in the cool of the day? And could it be that more than your behavior, what he wants is you? What does it tell us about God? It would tell us that the God that made us is a relational God before he's a rule-keeping, score-keeping Behavior noting judge of a God. We get that from the Old Testament, don't we? What might this tell us about personal development? That's what this class is about. What might it tell us about personal development if the God that made me made me to thrive in relationship? Now we're getting down to the issue of this course. Because this course is about life development and management. But if I think that I flourish because I can put some goals in place and climb the ladder of my own purpose through goals, I'm already on the wrong ladder. I'm trying to give you the big perspective. What might this tell us about ministry in the image of God? One of the other books that I've recommended in your syllabus is called Ministry in the Image of God by Siemens. And it's incredible. If you had that already in your reading, then, then we could move much faster. C.S. Lewis says, if he who in himself can lack nothing chooses to need us, it is because we need to be needed. Or you could put in place of need, put relate and relationship. If he chooses, he that needs nothing chooses to relate to us, it's because we need relationship. So we're reevaluating the ways we relate to God. This is from Sky Jathani's book, Reimagining the Ways We Relate to God. And I just start with these little quips that might mean something to you eventually. The greatest burden is the burden of potential. If you grew up all your life hearing about how great you were going to be, if you were voted most likely to succeed, sorry about that. If you're voted most likely to succeed uh, in your school, guess what? You carry the burden of potential. How do we respond to the prophetic word in our life? My oldest son is a very gifted young man. He's a worship pastor up in Seattle now. But growing up in the church, every guest speaker that would come through would prophesy over him. Sometimes they didn't even know he was my son. 
They would call him out, prophesy him over, over him and tell him that he was going to lead worship around the nations. He was going to write music that was going to impact nations. Da, 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 da. And finally, at the age of 16, he says, Dad, would you not let them prophesy over me anymore? What was he feeling? The burden of potential. What are you doing with a prophetic word? You see, what happens many times is if we have the wrong view of God, we think the prophetic word is the igniter to get us to work hard to make that word come to pass. <laughs> oh, I got my direction. Whew, now I'm going to work real hard to make that come to pass. What are you doing with the prophetic word in your life? The greatest freedom is the freedom of having nothing to prove. This is characteristics of a son. An orphan has to prove. He started behind the game. My dad was orphaned at 18 months. And I watched the adult impacts on his life as I was old enough to begin to see the difference between an orphan and a son. An orphan believes he has to prove that he's good because everybody said he couldn't. Everybody said he's a knucklehead. He won't. You know why Lee Harvey Oswald became a sharpshooter in the, in the military and eventually took out the president of the United States? Everybody knows the name, don't you? Lee Harvey Oswald, I know it's another generation. Because his mother, a single mom, told him continually, I could get somewhere if it wasn't for you that I have to carry around everywhere I go. You'll never amount to nothing. You'll never be anything. So what did he say in his orphan heart? He said, I'll become a sharpshooter. I know what I'll do. I'll exceed it. I'll, I'll excel at something. And I'll make a name for myself. And she bragged the day after John F. Kennedy's assassination to the police in Dallas that she's the mother of the man that killed the president. The greatest freedom is having nothing to prove. How do I just respond to the pressure of both work and rest? Can you really rest when it's time to rest? Can you really work when it's time to work? Not because you have something to prove, but because it's what God's given you to do. And he gives you the gift of rest just as much as the gift of work. Can you do it? with nothing to prove. The greatest joy is the joy of having nothing to lose. How can I have nothing to lose when you don't own anything? When you don't have to manage it all, when you don't have to own it, you don't have to possess it. The foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Well, we understand that he, he owns it all. If he, if he needed a donkey, what does he do? He tells himself, go over there. That guy's got one, it's tied up to the post, just telling the master needs it. He didn't have to own it all. He had access to everything, didn't he? But it was, a, it was an understanding of his heart that if you have all things, you have nothing to lose. It doesn't matter how much you give away. There's going to be more there waiting for you when you turn around. The panties never bear. If you're working to try to stockpile resources to insulate yourself from a bad day that's coming up, guess what? You're going to be driven to produce. The greatest love is laying one's life down for a friend. So how to be a friend when they do well and when they don't do well. Have you ever had anybody that was your friend and then they messed you over? No, nobody. Y'all made better choices than I did. The greatest love. So let's talk about life from God. We're going to go through these. And we're going to break it down. Life from God is valuing God's blessings and gifts, but they're not particularly interested in spending time with God himself, except to fulfill a prerequisite to, to receive what God has. Again, elder brother, the younger brother, the prodigal, we call him the prodigal son. But he was going after his father's stuff, but just in a defiant way. The elder brother was also going after the father's stuff, but in a compliant way. Compliant looks much nicer, doesn't it? Compliant can look saved. Compliant can look very Christian. Defiant gets you a testimony. <laughs> but neither one of them 
wanted to be with the Father. Jesus doesn't give us that whole story because that wasn't the purpose that he was telling. But why was he telling this story? He wasn't telling about the need for repentance. It really wasn't about the son. It wasn't even about the older brother. It was about a revelation of the father's heart that the father from day one was looking, looking, looking for the lost son. And we've said this before. You can't lose something if you don't first have it. The reason Jesus tells the story about the lost coin, the lost son, the lost sheep. Why? He's telling us the father owned you before you messed up. You belong to him before the foundation of the world. You were chosen as a son and daughter before you were ever a seed in your mother's womb. You were a son or daughter in the father's heart. That's a perspective that breaks us free from over, under, for, and from. Okay, let's break this down just a little bit. I know this is too small for you to see, uh, but you have the PowerPoint. All right. The role of Father God in this perspective is he's the generous source of all blessing in life. We praise him because all good blessings flow from him. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right. Is that true? Yes, it's true. It's true. I'm not saying it's not true. It's a perspective. The role of Jesus in this from perspective, he's the second chance at life. He's the ticket agency, the ticket master who has purchased a block of tickets for the big event for resale. He's giving you a way to get in or to get out of jail, if you will. The role of the Holy Spirit is the dispenser of gifts. He's the fulfiller of promises. He's going to be the one who actually gives you, hands you the tickets. He's the one that gets you what uh, you want from God. Stay with me. This is going to make sense. The role of the Holy Spirit, the dispenser of gifts, the role of leadership in the from God position is to articulate the rights and privileges of the believer. The leader, the leadership role, this is a pastor that's trying to pastor in a from God perspective. Your job then is to articulate the, the rights of the agreement. The promises of God, this is what you have, this is what you can cash in. Is that wrong? It's not wrong. It's there. It's true. But it's a wrong view of who God is. Who's the center of the universe? In this role, self and its desires are at center. And we'll use God, we'll use his principles, we'll use his precepts, we'll use all the mechanisms of Christianity to get what we want. Now that's saying it very hard. Nobody ever, nobody ever uh, approaches it that way. It's never somebody's initial intent or desire. The role of the Bible in the from God perspective is it's the member benefits handbook. A compilation of rights and privileges. So we're looking in the Bible at what I can get, what belongs to me. Is that wrong? No. It's just not all the way there. You see, when you get a realization that God has already given you everything by giving you Jesus Christ, then you're not constantly digging for what you don't have that you're trying to find. What's the role of prayer? To petition God for the things needed to make one happy, to fill one's interest. So our prayers are a long list of petitioning. We don't have a whole lot of time for just sitting in his presence, being with him. Enjoying his smile, his embrace, walking with him in the cool of the day. We've got to convince God that he's the only one that can get me what I need. And when it really gets serious, what do we do? We pray. The believer, you can't see this one here, but the believer is the consumer. Whose discontent is to be resolved by God's promises to meet my needs and maximize my potential. Sounds good. Now, I could take this slide right here, and in most places, I could teach that as Christian leadership, and everybody would say, amen. Woo, high five, I'm going for it. There's good things here. It's just not enough. It won't ever satisfy. 
lie for God. Life for God is values. This person values a significant life as one expended, accomplishing great things in God's service. This is the way I was raised. I don't know about you. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but this is the way I was raised. I was raised in a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church. We were missions minded church, and it was all about set your sights. The highest, greatest thing you could do is give your life forever in the service of God. Is that true? Yes. But if that's all you're going for, you can still burn yourself out working for God when what he'd rather do something else. Are you kind of catching the drift of this? Okay, let me let me go quickly. The role of Father God in the for God perspective, he's the conductor of the great orchestra. And we're all playing our instruments. We want the music to be massively good. We want to do our part and we're watching the conductor and we're following his clue. The role of Jesus to experience a great mission. He's the executive director. And if I follow, I have decided to follow Jesus. Well, thank God. Aren't you glad you decided to follow Jesus? Me too. I'm glad I've served him my whole life. I'm glad I've done everything that I knew to do. But now I find that no matter how hard you try to fulfill the greatest mission, there's something more. The role of the Holy Spirit here is to guide and empower mission. He's the producer of the great orchestral production. He's the producer. He's the one moving us around the globe. He's the one taking us places. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Role of leadership to encourage and facilitate missional and ministry opportunities to get the job done. Okay, there's a theology that has taken the day in the West especially, and we've exported it to most other nations on the planet. I call it the theology of pragmatism. Say it with me. The theology of pragmatism. What's pragmatism? Whatever works. Whatever works. And if we believe that what God really wants is the churches to be full, we're going to build it so they'll come. And we're going to have whatever kind of celebrity or raffle of the Harley Davidson or whatever we have to do to get the church building full. Now, I know you've never seen that anywhere, but it's a pandemic in Christianity, especially in the West. Do whatever it takes, have whatever guest speaker, whatever kind of music you have to have, whatever you have to produce to get everybody there. Why? Because we've been taught that church growth is the goal. We got to help Jesus build a church because he clearly doesn't know how to do it. So we don't mind robbing from all the other churches to get those same people in our church. So we feel like we've succeeded in pleasing God in building his church. I mean, you know, Jesus didn't tell us to build a church. He said, I'll build my church. You go make the kingdom available. The center of the universe is significance by divine mission. That's it. I'm only significant if I'm if I'm fulfilling a divine mission. So we'll go to conferences and we'll hear people give their testimonies of how they're fulfilling their divine mission. Ooh, I want to be like that. Let me just tell you, anything that attracts you, lures you to be like somebody else other than yourself, it's not enough. Paul says, why are you comparing yourselves against one another when you have all things? This is what he said. You are Christ. Christ is God's, the Father, and all things are yours. If you really understand that all things are yours, you won't want what anybody else has. You've already got it. Thank you for your enthusiasm. The role of the Bible is the biographical collection of heroes for God. These are the men and women that sold out. These are the men and women that live significant lives doing the great works of God. They're the heroes of the faith. Is that true? Yes, it's true. But if it was enough, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die. If it was enough to sell out, have a covenant with God, i.e. Old Testament, and just be a hero for God, Jesus would have never had to come. 
if he's just gathered heroes. But Hebrews chapter 2 does not say he's bringing many heroes to glory. It says he's bringing many sons to glory. Huge difference. Role of prayer in before God is to fulfill the requirements of a healthy devotional life to pay the price. Anybody ever heard pray the price? Pray the price? Maybe you have. To help revival happen. All right, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of punching on some sacred cows, and I, I expected you to be quiet. It's fine. Listen to this. When we are trying and striving for God, you know we're never there. The revival is always about to happen. Anybody ever recognize that the revival is always about to happen? The breakthrough is always just over the hill. The breakthrough is always coming, but somehow we never quite get there. You know why? Because that's not what the Father's after. Hang in there with me. The last line, which you can't see, is the role of the believer. The believer is a servant in this role. But I want to remind you, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But I've told you everything I'm doing. So he calls us friends, a covenant term, which would be family. All right, we're going to have to run. A believer is more than a servant, though we do serve. When you understand your relationship with God fully, serving's not a problem. Life under God values the simple cause and effect promise and rewards, uh, a ro rewards approach to discover what pleases or displeases God. Okay? The role of the Father is holy, righteous judge. The role of Jesus is to appease divine wrath. The role of the Holy Spirit in the under God view is to convict people of sin, to get them under the will of God. The role of leadership is the morality police. If the way to reduce fears and maintain control or receive blessing is a combination of morality and ritual, then leader's role is to keep everyone in line. So we set up rules. Let me just give you this. I hope if nothing else sticks with you, this will stick with you. Wherever there's low levels of relationship, there has to be high levels of rules. But wherever there's high levels of relationship, you'll see low levels of rules. Any church you go into, as soon as you kind of get a feel for how much rules they demand, require, that's going to tell you whether it's a relational place or not. Pretty easy to diagnose. Center of the universe is the divine will, the will of the gods. Okay, so we get into all kinds of patterns and rituals and, and things that we think is going to ring the bell, is going to bring heaven to earth, going to bring God to us. If we sing the right songs, have the right atmosphere, do the right things, compensate in the right ways, then we get the will of God. We, we, we don't talk much about the fact that the Holy Spirit already lives in us. Hello? We already have him in us. All right? That's under God. Life over God. I'm going to have to skip it for sake of time. This values the order of the universe. If I just work the right mechanisms and the right principles. And so the whole role of leadership in this dimension, life over God, it doesn't matter if I have a personal life with God. I don't really need to, to have a devotional life. I don't need to spend time with God. As long as I can use the right principles and the right precepts and make the right thing work. And if you look at most leadership conferences, this ought to get right to where we are. It might disappoint many of you, but if you look at most leadership conferences in the church today, the primary voices coming into the leadership conferences are people that are leading in the world. The corporate leaders. The church is feasting at the world's leadership principles because we have a sub- ordinary view of God. If we could just get these principles down, we don't care if, if Plato or Socrates is the one that, that extracted the principle. We don't care if it's Steve Covey that extracted the principle. If we just get these principles and they got a verse behind them, then we can work that principle. Then I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to run the risk of a messy relationship. Okay. We'll stop right here. And it's a very bad, bad place to stop. Because I'm right on the edge. 
Oh, the next one's really good. All, okay, just hear this with me, if you will. All of these things have truth to them. I'm not saying these are bad. I'm not saying they're bad. They all have truth to them. But Jesus came to give us more than a successful life. He came to bring us back to what? To the Father's heart, that we would be with him. What does Mark say about Jesus when he chose his disciples? I'll, I'll close with this. Mark 3, 14. He chose 12 that they should what? Be, be with, him. with him. And then that they should go and preach and cast out devils and all those things. God never ordained you and I get busy for God or under God without first being with God. Because he's the only one that knows whether you need to be working today or resting today. He's the only one that needs that, that can tell you whether you need to stop at that coffee shop and talk to the guy behind the coffee bar instead of going to that meeting. And he's the only one. If you're with him, you'll hear that. You'll know that. And if you want significance in life, if you want you want a mission that's grand, if you want something that's powerful, just think about what God can do if you just listen to his voice. Yeah. Day in and day out. Okay. I'd love to get right there and give you another hour of it, but we'll get there Thursday. Is that all right? Father, I pray your blessings on these folks. Give us ears to hear. Not a word of condemnation, not a word of guilt or shame, but a word of hope that you're actually bringing us into your own bosom, something better than success. You're giving us yourself something better than riches. You're giving us yourself something better than stories and, and, and great testimonies. You're giving us yourself. Let us live in it and rejoice in it and draw near to you in Jesus name. Everybody said together. <laughs> Amen. All right. Blessings to you. If I could have somebody to grab the sign up sheets there on the back table and bring those to me. So I can get out the ones for the new. And if you didn't sign in, all you need is your initials for today. Good morning. Let's see if I can, I'm doing good if I can find out how to turn this. Uh, Okay, now.